Um, how many of you know that today is a special day? Not only is it Daylight Savings, but it's the NRL Grand Final Day today as well. We got any Penrith supporters here? Any Panther supporters in the place? You know what? I re- you look ashamed of Panthers. You did this. Don't be ashamed of your team. You whacked that hand nice and I've got a Panthers. Any Parramatta supporters here? That's it. Throw the hands in the air. Okay, you two separate. You get over there. You get over there. <coughs> NRL Grand Final, you know? So you know what? Those guys will wake up this morning. <coughs> they will wake up this morning with great expectation of what is going to happen today, wouldn't they? They'd wake up and I know they've all got their routines and stuff. But they've got this. They know that at 3 o'clock today. Oh, no, it's not 3 o'clock. It's an evening game now, isn't it? They know it's 7.30. 7:30. Oh, if you're listening, Peter Valandis, three o'clock's a better time. Um, But they're going to wake up today, and when they wake up today, they know that at the end of the day, they're either going to be wearing an NRL premiership ring or they won't be. They're they're aware that at some point today, something amazing is going to happen, and there's this sense of expectation. I'm sure they've probably got their routines, and they're they're a bit jittery, and and, and all this sort of stuff. And when you you, uh, hear them interviewed, they've all got different routines. You know, some will have a sleep for half a day. Some of them uh, wake up and they put the same pair of socks on every morning before uh, the game. It's just the thing they do. You know, some people will, will um, uh, have pasta for lunch every game. They've all got their little routines. But, but there's this sense of expectation that something's going to happen today. Something amazing is going to happen today for those men. And anyone that's got a ticket today would have woke up too with a great sense of expectation. They're going to get to go to an NRL grand final. Anyone ever been to an NRL grand final in the room? Yep, which one? Yep, 05? No. Oh, really? Okay, should have been, should have been 05. Mine wasn't 05 either, but it should have been. We should have both went in 05. It's the last time the Tigers won a grand final. Uh, and for those of you that don't know who the Tigers are, they're an NRL team. Um, I saw a meme the other day, and it, it had a Tigers fan with a big smile on his face. And the thing underneath said, Tigers fan, when he realises next year the only way is up, because we finished last. And then I had the same guy with a big frown and a tear going, Tigers fan, when he realised there's actually 17 teams next year. <laughs> so we can actually drop one, but anyway. Um, saying all that to say something else, and I'll get to that in a second. So they woke up this morning and they had this sense of anticipation um, about what's going to happen today. Um, I just spent the week up in Brisbane at YWAM in Brisbane um, with, a, with a great bunch of young adults, uh, sort of early 20s and so on. And they uh, were doing the last week of their six-month, what they call a discipleship training school. So they had done their three-month lecture phase. They'd gone off. They'd just come back from Hungary. And they'd been working with Ukrainian refugees over there in Hungary on outreach. And they were sharing their stories. And, you know, it was amazing the the change in their worldview. They came back and uh, uh, quite a few of them were saying to me that, you know, what... When I, when, I, when I got there and came home, I realised that thing that I used to always complain about before I went over there, I realised, you know, it's just not that big of a deal. And I'm over there watching these families that have had to flee Ukraine and trying to cross borders and in refugee camps and things like that. And they just said, it just changed my perspective on my life and how tough I thought my life was and so on. And I hope and pray that, that when they go back home that that, that attitude continues because I have seen people go on mission trips and have experiences like that only six weeks later to forget it all and be right back where they started from. I, I believe that God blesses us to be a blessing. Amen? Yeah. God's not pouring blessing and good things into my life. And when I say blessing, I'm not just talking material things. I'm talking the revelation that he gives me. I'm talking the areas of my world that he straightens out, you know, the the breakthroughs that he gives me, the healing that comes. All that stuff that comes into my world is is making me into the person, helping me become the person he created me to be. But the, the end game is not just to be blessed, is it? It's, it's to be a blessing. That's, that's what God wants to do. He wants to get things to me and do things in me so that he can flow it through me so that I can actually be an answer to somebody else's prayer and be a solution to somebody else's problem. So I pray that that's what happens for them. But the week I was with them was called re-entry. It's their last week of their training. And so I go on in and I talk to them. I help them process the experiences and the things that God has, has, has done with them uh, in the, throughout the lecture phase of the DTS. But then we talk about what it looks like to transition back home. So that when they get home, they have a bit of an understanding of what to expect. And not only what to expect, but also uh, how, to, how, to, how to go back home and be a blessing. Don't go home and become critical. 
because your church doesn't look like YWAM or don't go home and get upset because you think your pastor doesn't have passion for God because you saw a mission leader over in Hungary who you watched for three weeks and thought, wow, there's someone fire for God and now you're judging everybody by that. So I, I, I was invited to go and spend some time with them. But while I was there... Um, I was reading on Thursday morning, I, I got my Bible out before lectures and I was just having a bit of a read and I came across a, a story in the book of Luke. I've read it many, many times before, but there was something that kind of stirred my heart a little bit in that. And I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about expectation. And it's kind of been a bit of a, a, a theme, I guess, this morning. Jackie talked a little bit about that. Um, expectation and, and what we are expecting in life. Do we have expectation or, or do we not have expectation? When those NRL players woke up this morning, they woke up with expectation that something was going to happen today. And I wonder in this room, and I wonder in many churches all around the world this morning, did we wake up with a sense of expectation that something could happen for us today as well? When we come to a gathering like this, do we come with a sense of expectation? Or are we ticking a religious box? I love what Jackie said in communion, that we do communion for a purpose and a reason. And there's this... Uh, uh, expectation that all of the things that have distracted us this week and pulled my thoughts over here where I'm worrying about how am I going to get my pool in the ground of my house coming up, we're trying to get a pool in and, and it's just fallen over on several occasions with builders and that I had to spend two weeks ago, I had to do an owner builder course I had to do my own uh, owner builder course, get all that logistics stuff organised and all the paperwork done and permits into council and all that stuff. And anyone ever dealt with council before? I don't like dealing with council. It's, I think they, they, they complicate simple things. That's, I think that's what councils do. They complicate simple things. Um, I like to simplify complicated things. That's my personality. And when I get around people that, that complicate simple things, my head does fuses pop and smoke comes out and I end up in the corner in the fetal position sucking my thumb going, help me, help me. And so... So expectation, what are you expecting today, here, in this place, this hour and a half, what are you expecting? When you walk out the door, what are you expecting? Have you thought about what you're expecting? Do you live as if you are expecting? We serve a God that these ancient documents tell us can do exceedingly abundantly. That's, that's big, that's another word for a lot, that's, I'll translate that to Aussie, Lots. God can do lots. Above all we can ask. And if I was to say to you now, let's just take five minutes, I want you to ask God the most grandiose things. Then after that, we're going to have five minutes and you're just going to think the biggest things you can. What are the biggest visions, dreams you got? It says that God can. Now, I'm not making guarantees and promises here because it doesn't say God will. Amen? I'm not God. I'm not God. And I don't know everything about God and everything God wants to do and say. And say I don't know all that. But what I do know is that I read a passage like that where it says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. And it's, that to me is painting a picture of the character and the nature of God. He's pretty big. God is lots. He's large. He's huge. And he's got ideas and things that he wants to do. And he wants to do things in the life of his children. He wants to do things through the lives of his children. He wants to do things in the car parks. He wants to do things in the pub this morning where people are sitting there at nine o'clock this morning already trying to forget all the pain and all the hurt and disappointment. Where people are sitting in gutters right now recovering from from all kinds of hits that they've taken. And God's looking at them going, I've got the exceedingly abundantly God is the same God that wants their life, wants their heart, because he's got these exceedingly abundantly things that he wants to do in and through them as well. But as God's people, here's the difference. We're aware of that. Amen? We're aware of that. We know that. We hear that all the time. We, We pick these pages up when we read it. And I wonder this morning, do we have expectation when we think about God? I was with the, these YWAMers and, you know, they're talking about going home. And one thing that was in the room was I was in a room full of expectation. They were expectant that, that, that this next season, you see, when one, when, one, when one chapter ends of a book, another chapter starts, doesn't it? I mean, the book's not over. Your life and my life, it's not over until we go. So there's, all, there's another page to turn. 
There's another chapter to read. It's, it's all there. God knows what it is. We don't because I haven't turned the page yet and haven't fully stepped into everything. But I'm on a journey, and I hope you are too, where we're wanting to step fully into everything that God actually has for us. Because apparently he has these exceedingly abundantly or lots of things that he wants to do in our world. And I sat down on Thursday and I read this story and you would have read it many, many times. It's in Luke chapter 2. It's a story about a man called Simeon. Simeon. And here's what it says. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. It says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for something. How many of you know you don't go to a bus stop and sit down at a bus stop waiting for a bus that you don't think is going to come? Anyone ever done that? You, 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 you don't do it. You just don't do it. Yet sometimes I say, you know, you ever, you ever been in a restaurant and people go to a restaurant and you sit down and a waiter comes over and the waiter says, oh, can I uh, take your order from the menu? Sir? It's a French restaurant I'm talking about. Or, you know, and that's my best French accent. I've got nothing better than that. <laughs> Are you ready to order, sir? It's... I'll get in trouble if I keep doing accents. Someone's going to say, eh. that's, a, that's, that's all you're getting. But you order it, right? And they take the order. And then what do they do? They take that order and they go away. And then you kind of you sit there and you're relaxed because you've got an expectation that meal's going to come. Isn't that right? I mean, you've given the order to the waiter. And so you're expecting that meal's going to come. The waiter doesn't come over and say, hey, can I take your order? And straight away you go, well, you can, but you better bring it, all right? You better make sure that food makes it to my table. We, 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 we place that order and then we sit in expectation. And we get on with life. We, get on with, we have our conversations and we do what we're doing. We get on, but, but, but we're expecting that food's going to come. It's like waiting for the bus. The bus is going to be there at 9 o'clock to take me from point A to point B. And I get there and I'm waiting. Now, maybe at 9.02 the bus isn't there. Right? But you know what? I look at the timetable. I go, no, no, no. I know. I know that the bus is, is, is coming. There's no notifications to say otherwise. I know the bus is going to come eventually. Maybe not be in my time frame, but the bus is going to come. But you wait in expectation. And here's a guy that it says he was waiting in expectation for something. We don't know how long Simeon had been waiting, but I'm guessing from the, the background of the story that Simeon had been waiting for a long time. But he just kept waiting. He was just waiting. Didn't give up. Didn't move himself onto a different place. Didn't come to the conclusion, well, this thing I've been waiting for that God said I was going to see is not going to happen now. So he just laid it all down and gave it all up. It says, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. Is the Holy Spirit on you this morning? Well, here's the thing. Only two people are confident to say that. Well, you need to get back into this collection of ancient documents if you are a believer in Jesus, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, if you have committed your life to following him, then you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what these ancient documents teach. Even if you don't speak in tongues. Ooh, ooh. That's what I believe when I go through these ancient documents. So don't sit there second guessing because I'm not sure I don't speak in tongues. Maybe I don't know. No, no, no. It's, it's, a, it's a gift. It's not the only thing. So who has the Holy Spirit on them in this place this morning? Okay, handful more. I haven't got time to keep chipping away at the rest here. Yeah? Just believe it. That's right. Okay. The Holy Spirit was on him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. That's a long time, isn't it? I mean, that's not, that's not the promise you want. You want the promise that says, you know what? Uh, you're 25 now. By the time you're 30, this is going to happen. You want, I want that promise. I don't want God to come and say, you know what? I'm gonna, uh, you're going to see this promise before you die. What sort of promise is that? Before I die? God, what does that mean? Am I going to die next week? Are you going to reveal it to me quickly? Because then when you do see it, you're probably thinking, oh, my life's over. Or you're 80, 90, 100 going, oh, God, when are you going to do this thing? I've gone all those years. When you die, I want a better time frame than when you die, Lord. So if God promised for me, I want a better time frame than when you die. But he says, you're going to see this before you die. Before you die. And then it says this. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple court. So one day, so here he is, he's waiting. He's waiting for something that God has told him is going to happen and he's got this expectation and we don't know, but all we know is he goes to bed and wakes up. At night time, it hasn't happened. He goes to bed, he wakes up. By night time, it doesn't happen. He goes to bed, he wakes up. By night time, it hasn't happened. He goes to bed. 
It just keeps going on. Then one day it says the Holy Spirit moved upon him. So he just felt impressed by the Holy Spirit, impressed by God. It says moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts on this particular day. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. And here's what he said. He said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. What an amazing, amazing life lived with expectation. I'm expecting to see something from God. In his case, it was to see Jesus, the Messiah, before he passed. And when he saw that Messiah, he was so fixed and so anticipating God in his world and so focused on the God part of life that when it came to pass, he said to the Lord, you can take me now, God. You can take me now. Because that's, that's what I'm living for. I'm living for you, God. I'm living to see the things that you want me to see. I'm living to, to, to receive what you have for me, to be who you want me to be, to do what you want me to do. This is a life worth living, a life with expectation in God. So Simeon lived with an expectation of seeing what God was doing in his lifetime and in his world. And when he saw it, he went, it doesn't get any better than this, Lord. You can take me now. Isn't that amazing? I think about my own life and, and I think about my expectation to see God and to be a part of what God is doing in my generation. And, and I, I think about Simeon and I think, gee, I, I, would, I would so love to have that kind of sense of expectation and be so, uh, be so locked into the expectation of seeing God and, and so fulfilled just to see God in this world. I, I was talking to these DTS students and, and we were talking about, um, I was trying to get them to see the difference between their generation and the world they're growing up in. And by the way, it's not their fault. It's just the world that they've inherited and it's, it's convenient and, and, and lots of things, and, uh, but it's not perfect, just like previous years. But I was trying to get them to see the difference. And, 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 and one of the things that, that, um, that we talked about uh, bet- between the two generations, uh, I just had a point there. You ever have those moments where you go vague? You're talking about something you go vague? I just had a vague moment. I was, I was going to say, it was a really good point, by the way. Um, I felt like God was going to do something with that. Um, in, in this lifetime, I want to see expectation of lifetime in this world. I'm trying to think now because I, I haven't got my... The, I've, I'm pretending I've got heaps of notes here. I've got a few, but um, you know, I walk away and I just, I just talk. But um, anyway, Simeon lived with an expectation of seeing what God was doing in his lifetime uh, and in his world. And the question is, do we? Is that what we're about? Is that what's on our heart? Uh, are, we, are we wanting to see what God wants to do in our lives? Is that a, a great expectation for you? Are you wanting to see what God wants to do through you? Is that an expectation for you? Are you wanting to be be a part of whatever God is doing in this generation, in this city, in this town, in this place? Is that your heart? Is that a part of your world? That's right. Here's what I was going to say. Young kids today, I was saying, you know, when when, when you go to work, there's this value on, I want to feel fulfilled. I know young people that they get a job and they quit a job without a job and find another job and quit a job without a job. I, I was raised, don't quit the job unless you've got another job to go to. Because you've got, you've got responsibilities and things, you know? So when I had, ja- had my... I had Jackie. When I had, my wa- when I had my wife, here we go, it's all vague. When we got married and we had kids, I went... I, I wouldn't quit a job unless I had a job. I, I, you've got to make sure that I had a means of supporting my family. But the point is this, that previous generations, uh, they went to work. Uh, the fulfilment was in knowing they cared for their family. The fulfilment was in knowing that I brought in money and kept... Food on the table, a roof over my... You go back and ask your grandparents, your great-grandparents. That was what it was for. They never asked the question, am I fulfilled in my job? Not that I'm saying it's bad. Please don't misinterpret. But what I'm saying is that, 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 that we've got a generation that want fulfilment in their employment, so they just jump around until you find employment in that. These guys found fulfilment in caring for their community and caring for their, their family and being able to give their kids a better life. That's where the sense of fulfilment was. They, they, they lived with uh, a different set of expectations and so on. So going back to Simeon, it was so central to who he was, this sense of expectation to see God, that once he'd seen what he was in anticipation of, he actually says to God, you can take me now. I mean, that's just amazing. That's just amazing. The promise of God comes to a person. And when that promise comes to pass, they go, that is a life well lived, Lord. I experienced a promise from God. It's over. If you want to take me now, God, you can take me. Amazing, amazing prayer. From Simeon's perspective, what he was meaning was this. Now that I have seen the object of my expectation, that was a life worth living. But I think from God's perspective, 
God would have been looking down on Simeon every day saying, each day lived with expectation was a day worth living. Every day that you lived with expectation was a day worth living. And people that live with expectation, I think, tend to walk around with a bit more of a spring in their step than people who have zero expectation about their life. And I'm a big believer too that as believers, we should have more expectation than most. Amen? Because we're not just thinking about this see, taste, touch, smell, experience, feel world. We realise there's another world, there's another dimension happening. We realise that we're not just limited to what we can see, taste, touch, smell. We realise that we uh, too have the power of God and the spirit of God. We realise that we, in Corinthians, Paul writes and says we have the mind of Christ. We realise we're connected to the creator of the universe. We realise that the Holy Spirit is with us and walks with us every single day and we have access to the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit, the guiding, the leading of God. So with all that stuff thrown in our basket, I think the church should be the leaders in the world. If, if expectation was a product, we should have it in spades full compared to people who are living without hope and putting their hope in things that are going to rust and destroy and fall apart. So expectation is this. Expectation is a belief that something will happen or is likely to happen. That's the, I think it's the Cambridge Dictionary definition. Expectation is, is, is the belief that something will happen or is likely to happen. Simeon, every day, walked through life thinking with the likelihood that the promises of God, they will happen. or, or if, Even if they don't, they're very, very likely going to happen. I think Simeon was a bit of a glass half full guy when it came to God. He's going to do this, or, and, and if he doesn't do it, that's the least likely outcome. Most likely, he's going to do something today. Most likely, something's going to happen. I love that kind of expectation. And so I just want to uh, throw out your three simple little things real quickly that I think expectation unlocks, that I see here in the story of Simeon. First thing, expectation unblocks our ears. Expectation unblocks our ears. In other words, we more easily hear from God if we're expecting that God wants to speak to us. If you're expecting that, 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 that God wants to interact with you, wants to speak to you, then you'll posture yourself in a place where you are more likely to hear from God than a person who wakes up every day and has zero expectation that God wants to say something to them. Amen? Amen? God wants to say something to you. I'm a big believer in this. I'm a big believer that God speaks to us all the time. I believe that God is always speaking to us. I don't think we always hear God. But I do believe that God speaks to us. I believe that God tries to get our attention and, and, and speaks to us. But we don't always hear God. Sometimes it's the pressures of the world, the cares of life. Sometimes we're so distracted with other things. But I do believe that God wants to speak to us. It says of Simeon, it said that it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. God told him something. God spoke to him. And I think people that live with expectation, it tends to unblock their ears. Expectation unblocks our ears. Jackie had to go this week. She came up to Brisbane for me um, uh, on, on Sunday and Monday and, and her and Chloe came back on Tuesday while I was up there. And while she was there, she had to get into a doctor because she had a blocked ear. Anyone ever had a blocked ear? She had this blocked ear, right? And uh, tried the, the drops and jazz, didn't work. Bottom line, just so happened by a miracle of God, she goes all the way to Brisbane, couldn't get in to see anybody here, drives up to Brisbane, rings up, and there's a surgery uh, five k's down the road that says, we've got a booking right now. And so she went straight in there, bang, they, they did the ear and so on, flushed the ear out, and now she can hear again. She can hear again. Yeah, thank you. It's amazing. I don't know if you noticed, when she was preaching last week, she kept doing this one. She was off balance. She'd be preaching and then... Because it affects your balance, you see, your hearing. So anyway, went in there and got flushed. But she told me afterwards that the doctor said this to her. The doctor said that, you know, um, you should go in. Everyone should be going in and getting their ears flushed at least once a year. Everyone should go in and get their ears flushed out once a year. And, and you know what? I thought, wow, that's actually really, really profound. Um, you may have had expectation once, but you've got to keep coming back to expectation. Expectation unblocks our ear. And if, I, if you were to do a graph in this room right now, where is your expectation of hearing from and, and, and being used by and having God interact with you? Where's your God expectation right now? If we had a chart from zero to 100, where would your expectation be? Because I think expectation goes like this. And we all know this, don't we? Expectation goes bang. You hear a great sermon, read a book, go to a conference, and expectation red lines. And then two weeks later, you get back to normal life. And and then something happens and we go, 
And we've got to keep coming back to expectation. We've got to keep coming back to what does God say? What has God said to us? What are his promises? We've got to keep finding our way back to that. It's like flushing that ear every year. Every now and then we've got to go and unblock our ears and remind ourselves that God is speaking and remind ourselves of all the great things that God has said. Second thing that expectation does is expectation moves our feet. Expectation has this ability to move our feet. It says that that Simeon was moved by the Spirit. He went into the temple courts. There's something about expectation that gets our, gets our feet moving. Everyone do that. Just in your chair. Just move your feet. Yeah, there you go. Expectation gets our feet moving. Expectation moves us from just intentions to actions. Uh, an, an expectant person moves beyond just intentions, thoughts and ideas. An expectant person gets action behind those thoughts, those intentions and those ideas. James puts it this way. He says, become doers of the word, not hearers only. Did you know it's possible to sit in church your whole life and be a hearer only? It's possible to sit there your whole life and be a hearer only. Jesus talked about that, didn't he, in, in Luke chapter 6, the, the parable of the wise and foolish builder. And he says this story, says that, that the wise man heard the words of Jesus, but he says he went and did what James said, became a doer of them. The storm came, the house stood. But he says there was also another group of people, he said they heard the words of Jesus too, but they didn't do them. They still went and built a house, still went and built a life. Storms came and it fell down and great and thunderous and loud was the crash of that house. So what he's saying is they're all sitting in church together. Some people, though, are going to become doers. Some people are going to be happy just to be hearers. They're going to be happy just to be hearers. In other words, there's not enough expectation to get them moving their feet. Not enough expectation that what God says is true and what God promises can come to pass and how God says life looks best when lived this way. There's not enough expectation for them to actually move their feet and actually start doing that stuff. But expectation unblocks our ears and expectation also moves our feet. We're way more easily led by the Spirit when you're a person of action than a person of intention. God looks for people of action. He looks for people whose feet are not stuck to the ground. God comes to those people and he uses those people. God has no intention of giving you intentions. God's not living, sitting up there going, I've got great intentions for what's going to happen on planet Earth and I'm going to just give my intentions to somebody that I know will keep it as an intention. No, God wants action. The steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered by the Lord. The steps are ordered, not the intentions, not the ideas, the steps are. In other words, a person with expectation moves their feet. And God steers that moving ship. So get moving. If you're not moving, I wonder, do you have expectation in the truthfulness of God? Do you have any expectation that what's on the other side of obedience is everything that God says is coming your way? Do you have that expectation in your life? Because if you do, you'll get your feet moving. Don't be hearers only. You see, the point is that faith moves us. And here's a thought. If your faith is not moving you, I would encourage you to go home and examine your faith. If your faith does not move you, then have a look and see whether it's what these ancient writers referred to as faith. There's a difference between giving mental assent to a set of facts and nodding and agreeing and going, yes, I think that's right. There's another thing with actually living out those things. And the intention of God is that we would live out these things, not just nod and go, amen, isn't that awesome, but then walk off and build a house, but not do it the way Jesus was trying to tell us. This is how you build a house. Because Jesus doesn't just want you to have a great looking house. He wants you to have a house that can handle a storm. Amen? He wants you to have a life, not a carefree, trouble-free life that's perfect and you're always smiling and nothing bad happens and no pressure comes against you. No, no, Jesus said, here's, here's the thing. Jesus was guaranteeing that the pressure's going to come, the storm's going to come. That's what he's saying in the parable. So in the good and the bad, they both had a storm come against them. So it's not about building some kind of life where we're impervious to all the bad things that can happen in the world. We can still, cut me, I still bleed, no matter how holy I am. But push me, I have the capacity to stand up in God through my expectation, through faith, through what God does on the inside of me. Like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, we sang that song earlier, Another in the Fire. They said, you know what, you can, you, you can barbecue us if you want to. That's okay. But here's the deal. I know that my God won't let it happen. He's going to save us. However, even if God doesn't save us from the barbecue, he's still God. Doesn't change nothing. And we're still going to worship him. And we're still going to live for him. And we're going to die for him if need be. What amazing expectation. 
What amazing expectation. And the third thing that expectation does, firstly, it unblocks our ears. Secondly, it gets our feet moving. And the third thing is that it opens our eyes. People with expectation more easily see God in the world around them. People that walk through the day with expectation that God is, at work, God is doing things, they're the kinds of people that easily see, more easily see when God does show up and when God is doing something than people who walk around without any expectation. It says that um, uh, Simeon said, You may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. My eyes have seen it. I know that you're doing things, God. I know, I know that you're active. I know that you're moving. And you know what? Because I'm expecting when you move in front of me, I pick it up. I pick it up. Um, anyone ever heard of um, um, uh, BC and AD? Yeah? Before Chloe and after departure. Huh? Okay? Now, Chloe's living in this uh, state of spin at the moment because I've been talking to Jackie about, you know, in a, in a, in a, a year and a half maybe, something like that, she's gonna, she wants to go to uni in Brisbane. That's part of what we did when we were up there was one afternoon we went to check out a university up there. And uh, so we've had life before Chloe, um, but now we're getting ready for uh, AD, which is life after departure of Chloe. And one of the things we've talked about is, you know, we'd love to do some um, weekend, you know, weekend, when I say weekend, you're pastoring a church, um, like Friday, Saturday or midweek when Jackie's got some time, we want to do some little trips and go around. And so we've been toying with the idea of a camper van or a caravan or something like that. Um, and in order to do that, we need to upgrade the car. So my uncle owns a car yard and he looks after me and he's known for a while we're looking for something. So long story short, he found this fantastic uh, car. It's a 2007 model, but it's a great car. And uh, so I've just sold my car um, uh, yesterday. Got sold yesterday, my, my white one, and we've been able to buy this other car um, off my uncle because we're getting ready um, to travel. We're getting ready to go. But the interesting thing is this. Once, once he told me what the car was, this is the car you're going to get. This is what I've got for you sitting here waiting. As soon as you sell yours, you can have it. As soon as you tell me what the car was, you know what? All of a sudden, I start seeing that exact car, that model everywhere. Anyone ever have that experience? Like, like, like you, you think that there's no such thing as a lime green Volkswagen Beetle. Like you've never seen a lime green Volkswagen Beetle in your life. But because someone says to you and starts talking to you about lime gold, green Volkswagen Beetles, all of a sudden... You pass one every 10 minutes and you're like, oh, wow, they've always been there. It's always been going on. They've been driving past you every day of your life. You've never noticed them because you never were in a space of expectation of seeing one. So you didn't see it when we bought our first Tarago when our kids were all small. Same thing, I'd never seen a Tarago van. Or had I? Yes, I had. I would have seen thousands of Tarago vans, but I never noticed a Tarago van until we bought one. Then I saw or noticed Tarago vans flying past me all day, every day, until I had one, I swear there was no such thing as a Tarago. I would swear that the first ever Tarago was the one we bought because they never existed. And all of a sudden, you're seeing them everywhere. That's the power of expectation, isn't it? When we're expecting something, we're much more open and likely to see what we are expecting. And that's how expectation works. So where it says there, my eyes have seen, here's what the Greek word literally means. It means to see with the eyes, to see with the mind, to perceive, to know, to become acquainted with by experience. In other words, you could sum it up by saying becoming aware of. You become aware of what God is doing in your world and through your world and around your world. It's like this, this, this obsession some people have with finding the will of God for my life. And they paralyze themselves and do nothing. Or they go to work every day and they sit there and they don't do the best work they could because they think that, oh, this is not the will of God. So when I get in the will of God, then I'll really, you know, even though it's very clear, whatever you do, do is under the Lord. Um, but, but, the, but, but people obsess over the will of God for their life, right? I think instead of obsessing over what's the will of God for my life, just realize that every day you wake up, God, God's will is at work somewhere. So instead of obsessing about what's the will of God for my life, why don't you wake up and say, God, how does my life fit into your will today? Wherever I am, whether I think I'm meant to be in this job or not, guess what? I'm there today. And God's doing something and might want to do something. I might want to say something. I might want to show you something. The supermarket I'm shopping at, the mechanics place, we don't know. But if we walk through life every day with that expectation that there's a God that loves the world so much so that he gave his only son to die for that world, he didn't just send Jesus and then sit back and go, right, I'm done with him. We'll just kick back and count down the hours till we return, shall we? He's doing things. None of you would be in this room if it was not for the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. No, no, I just found God. You didn't find God. 
God came looking for you and was tugging at you and, and twisting and turning and pushing and prodding. And you surrendered to that one day, but he came after you because he comes looking for us because he loves us. He loves us, amen? And God is doing stuff everywhere. And when we live with expectation, we make ourselves the kind of person that can get into that slipstream and be a part of what God is doing. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says this about gathering. And you've probably heard this passage before. We, we like to use it to manipulate people to come to church. Just being honest, I heard it all the time. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let me ask you again, who came here this morning expecting to be used by God? Who came here this morning expecting that God wants to do something in your world, but God wants to do something through you as well? You're blessed to be a blessing, amen? You know, what, you know one of the problems with church? If you're not preaching or you're not on the mic or something, then you're not going to get your hands on one of these things. Most people don't turn up with any sense of expectation that God could use them. And that's the truth. Everybody thinks, well, for God to use me, I've got to have one of these in my hand. If that's what you think, bring your own microphone. <laughs> Honestly, if your, faith, if, that, if your faith meets at that point, bring your own microphone. Come and see me, I'll give you one. You can sit there and hold it in your hand. If you think it's going to make you more useful to God, sit there. It just won't be plugged in. That's okay. That's all right. It doesn't have to be because this is just, we do what we do because it's our part. It's a gift. It's a call, whatever. But, but you know what? The world doesn't stop and start with somebody saying something through a microphone to a crowd. Right? It, it, it's not the be all and the end all. Who came here this morning expecting to be used by God? Who prayed this morning before they came that God might show them who they could spur on? What does it say about why do we gather? Why do we gather? It's very clear. We don't just gather so that the church can count bums on seats and go, yes, we're growing. Yeah. Oh, half of you are away today. It's terrible. It's terrible. What is the Lord doing? Oh. No, no, no. It's not about that. It says that we gather together that we can, firstly, it says let's consider how we may spur one another on. Before you came here this morning, did you pray, Lord, I'm going to gather today because it's right that we gather. It's good to do it. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spur someone on to love and good works and encourage someone. That's why we're gathering. Not just to hear a follow up front with a microphone and a band play music and worship. It's more than that. How are you going to spur? Did you pray this morning before you come every Sunday? Do you pray on the way here and say, Lord, today I'm gathering together. And the reason, the purpose why I'm gathering together is to spur somebody on to love and good works. It's to encourage someone today. So Lord, I'm praying right now. Would you show me that person? Just get my attention on that person today because I want to spur someone on to love and good works today. I want to encourage someone in their faith today. God, I'm going to... See, expectation turns a congregation into participants, not just spectators. It turns a church, turns a gathering into a room full of participants in whatever it is that the Lord wants to do. Instead of sitting there like a bunch of spectators. And sometimes church can be like a spectator sport, can't it? We, we give our tithes and our offerings. It's like paying the entry fee to come in and see the film. And then somebody, you know, sings a few songs and they talk to us. And then we go. It's more than that. The reason why we gather is because we need to come together. It's a room full of people with expectation that God wants to do something, not only in them, but through them. Imagine what could happen if everybody turned up with faith and expectation, expecting that today I'm not just here to be a consumer and get, but I'm going to contribute something to the kingdom of God and to the growth of somebody else. What could happen? John Wesley said this once. He said, give me a hundred people on fire for the Lord and filled with the Spirit, and I'll change an entire nation. And I still think that the truth of that stands. Filled with fire, filled with the Spirit, passionate about the Lord, not, not content to be spectators in what's happening in the kingdom, but wanting to contribute and do something there. An expectant life turns kingdom spectators into kingdom participants. Let me finish up with a thought. There's going to be two types of people that walk out that door today. Which type are you? There are going to be those that walk out the door and what they're doing is they're just leaving church at 11.30. You're going to walk out that door and you're telling yourself, I'm leaving church. That's fine because, you, you know, I guess technically you are if you think church is the building, you, you, you know. There's going to be people that think they're just leaving church. There's going to be another bunch of people who walk out that door realise they're being sent. Are you leaving church or are you being sent? You know what the big difference is? It's expectation. What are you expecting for the rest of the day? What are you expecting for the rest of the week? Are you expecting 
to have your ear unblocked and to hear from God? Are you expecting to get your feet moved by expectation that God's going to use you? Are you expecting to have your eyes opened up and to see what it is that the Lord's doing around your world? Because he's doing things, he's speaking things, and he needs participants in the kingdom, not just consumers. Amen. Lord, thank you this morning, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence with us, God. And Lord, thank you again for the, I guess, the prophetic uh, nature of, of what you've spoken over this gathering. We are arise, Lord. We're about standing up when we don't feel like it. We're about moving forward when we feel like we can't. We're about stirring up the Spirit of God inside of us. We're about, uh, Lord, uh, going, arise, shine, for our light has come. The glory of the Lord's upon us. Lord, we're about being the blessing, not just the blessed. And so, Lord, I just pray this morning, God, would you seal in people's hearts anything the Holy Spirit was saying. Lord, just seal it in people's hearts this morning. The rest of it, water off a duck's back. Who cares? But God, if there's something you've been speaking to individuals here, would you water that seed? And I pray, God, as each person walks out that door, that they would know that they're not just leaving church. They are being sent. They are being commissioned by the Holy Spirit to go into all the world and to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Make disciples. Preach the gospel. You have been blessed. Go be a blessing in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just pray too in the next seven days, would you give everyone in this room, everyone that is, is following you, God, give all of us an opportunity to tell somebody about the goodness of God. There are people out there in our community, they have no idea what happened 2,000 years ago. They have no idea of the reality of Jesus. They have no idea of the life that you want to offer them, God. So give us a chance to point them in that direction. In these next seven days, we pray it with great anticipation. And everybody said, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys.